have we started the session okay we we'll just started. wait one minute and then we can begin we we'll just wait for the attendees to log in Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the last uh, and uh, third session on sexism in the online publics. Uh, um, our webinar series. Please uh, see the house rules uh, for the norms on interaction during this event. Um, uh, this is the third part of a three-part webinar series on misogynistic hate speech. Uh, this session will last 90 minutes. Uh, our session today is titled How Should the Law Deal with Misogyny Online? A Feminist Framework for Legal Reform. Um, and uh, we request all panelists except the speaker to keep their mics off during the presentation. Um, we'll be live tweeting this session at IT for Change. Um, and uh, audience members are free to uh, interact with everybody through the chat box. The Q&A section is also open. Uh, so please uh, send in your questions through there. And uh, uh, we look forward to a very engaged uh, conversation today. Um, before we begin, I'd like to set some context to the conversation we hope to have today. And uh, I begin with a somewhat rhetorical, but un not unimportant question, which is uh, how can media maximize not simply freedoms, but justice? The idea of justice is something that scholars, philosophers, and judges have grappled with for centuries, an idea that must evolve with the enlightenment brought on in every era to respond to the questions of morality, or what Michael Sandel calls the right thing to do. Social media platforms are often seen as a technology that can help us grasp the utilitarian ideal of maximizing participation. For instance, the free basics debate was a strong plea for utilitarianism. Political philosophers have critiqued the limitations of utilitarian approaches by arguing why the right cannot be replaced by the good, since the concept of right is prior to that of the good. Alternatives such as the Rawlsian view of justice as fairness, or more recently, the capabilities approach uh, by Amartya Sen that has centered human flourishing, are useful to help us understand and develop solutions to the very vital question of injustice as it arises in the public sphere created by social media platforms today. In the crucial discourse of gender-based violence is the fundamental issue of sexist hate a civilizational anomaly that prevents women's right to public participation, thus negating their full citizenship. On social media, sexist hate exists on steroids. We now stand at a crossroads where the policy choices about the governance of the digital that we take now become crucial to determining whose lives will matter in the democracies of tomorrow. Our laws have been shown to be lacking not only in implementation, but also in their very epistemic foundations. For instance, there seems to be little point in lamenting the non-application of Section 67 of the IT Act when it is rooted in provisions of the Indian Penal Code with values that hold a narrow view of women's dignity and largely inconsiderate of their autonomy. To compound this disempowerment produced by the language of the law are processes that further undermine women and people of non-normative genders in their ability to navigate the new online publics. The reading down of Section 79 in Shreya Singhal case has also led to a diminishing of the power present in user complaints to social media platforms, whether about non-consensual circulation of intimate images or sexist hate. New choices need to be made, and they are about, one, the limits to behavioral data extraction and processing by social media platforms, two, a content governance framework rooted in constitutional ideas of dignity, equality, and privacy, ensuring a balance between freedom of expression and freedom from indignity and violence for the digital context, and three, a new regulatory institution at the national level committed to a free feminist framework for enforcing women's rights to online spaces. A social media experience that is designed not to maximize clicks, but for user safety, the de minimis requirements of which are set by 
the publics and which incorporates a normative design decision to restrict re circulation of socially harmful content and a prudent use of human mediated algorithmic processes. It is therefore my privilege to introduce, to discuss these very pithy issues, our speakers today. We will have opening remarks from Honorable Justice Ravi Shakhtar, sitting judge of the Delhi High Court, who has been generous enough to chair this session. Our moderator is Mr. Vishal Gogne, who is additional sessions judge with the Delhi Higher Judicial Services, and we are heartened to have his support today. Our panel features scholars and advocates and activists who are deeply engaged in the promise of a feminist future. We have with us Aarti Raghavan, an advocate practicing at the Bombay High Court, Maria Saleem, who is a co-founder of Zaria, a Women's Alliance for Dignity and Equality, Vaishali Bhagwat, an advocate practicing at the Bombay High Court, and Brinda Bhandari, an advocate at the Supreme Court of India and Delhi High Court. I will now, without further ado, hand it over to our esteemed moderator. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bhavna. I think uh, in uh, just about a breath, you've captured everything from Bentham to Rawls to communitarians down to uh, Professor Amartya Sen, and quite rightly so, because you've uh, sort of activated the, uh, let's say, the normative compass, because after all, this third session that we're all uh, caring to join today seems to be looking to uh, have a normative framework to the laws that we seek to enact. So it's really our hope from the panel today that we don't limit ourselves to a, um, suggestions limited only to provisions, laws, and uh, the likes and notifications which can be brought about, but somehow identify the norms that we seek to promote through this discussion. Um, I would very briefly want to uh, structure the present uh, debate into uh, four or five distinct parts. Uh, at the outset, we'll be requesting Honorable uh, Justice Rajiv Shagdar to give direction to the program uh, with indicators or his thoughts, then we'll have a, um, let's say an identification of the problem at hand. All of us seem to relate to this issue of uh, misogynist speech online in uh, segments, you know, it's either cyber trolling, it's stalking, it's doxing, it's voyeurism, there's so many manifestations. But we would want to understand something more let's say the intersectional expression when certain social attributes, let's say caste and religion, they interact with gender. So our first speaker for the day, Maria Ji, I hope with her experience would be sharing some of these intersectionalities. The second component as we uh, kind of agreed was to frame the normative problem at hand. Are we to see the issue in standalone segments of obscenity, liberal expression, free speech versus reasonable restriction, or we are going to moderate it with concepts of autonomy as far as gender is concerned, as far as the nuanced expression of, uh, you know, some of these controls that we are seeking to bring, what is the effect of all that? So that's going to be trying to set a normative framework to the discussion. And of course, uh, I believe Aarti Ji will also be speaking on the uh, legislative suggestions uh, she has in mind. Uh, the remaining half of the program we propose would be uh, in a way a for and against proposition, though not strictly so, where uh, uh, Ms. Vaishali Bhagwat, uh, we assume, would be speaking on the need for special legislation to counter misogynist speech. And as a sort of counterpoint, we'll have uh, at the end of the debate, uh, Ms. Bhandari, to bring forth the other side of the picture, as in, um, let's say, the downside to all legislation. And I, I assume she hopes to uh, point to the misuse of some of the other uh, legislations. So we'll start off the session by uh, inviting Maria Ji to speak. Um, uh, I believe Justice Shagda, I'm sorry, would be opening the session with a few remarks. Uh, sir. So that's all right, Vishal. Uh, we can have Maria. I, I, I would request that I uh, really think we'll get some direction with your thoughts. So, uh, is that all right with you, Maria? Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, inviting me on this session. I'm glad to see that uh, I have uh, four uh, women panelists, and if you include An Anita, and I'm not too sure whether Anita is going to speak. We have five women and two men. We are outnumbered, happily so. Uh, uh, I'm happy for two reasons, uh, uh, you know, 
for having accepted this invite. Uh, this was uh, on a short notice, but I did decide to accept it, uh, principally for two reasons. One, I think uh, change can be brought about if there is conversation on this issue. And more the conversation, the better it is. And therefore, I wanted to be part of this. Second, which according to me is uh, very important, is that if you can't uh, immediately in the near future uh, change the mindset of uh, those who perpetuate this crime, at least uh, bring about a change in the mindset of those who are uh, stakeholders in correcting uh, or uh, let's say dealing with this uh, very, very uh, sort of degrading and humiliating crime in so far as women are concerned. So I consider myself uh, at a very uh, sort of a, a, a stakeholder, a crucial stakeholder. Why? Because I represent an institution and so does Vishal, which uh, more often than not deals with these issues and therefore uh, it's good to hear what people have to say and how corrections can be made. I would have been happier if you had, um, you know, other stakeholders as, as well, people in the police, a legislature, uh, perhaps uh, even um, a, a woman politician, uh, you know, uh, who, who, who would have uh, then carried forward uh, the happy end or the constructive agenda that we have before us. Now, uh, it will be actually carrying a uh, coal to Newcastle if I were to talk about uh, areas who uh, all of you as uh, domain experts uh, in this particular field of uh, the law are concerned. But just to put a sort of an overall view, uh, what we are seeing today, as we all know, and women and you know, I have a family consisting of five women, and I, I, I face this every day where, where they, you know, sort of bring up these issues before me, is that what we are seeing today is nothing new. I mean, women have been treated, uh, sadly, as chattel for ages. There has been uh, miso misogyny and sexism hurled at them uh, day in and day out. It is only now that... Uh, we are dealing with a beast, uh, I will call it relatively recently since the internet has come and therefore uh, we don't know how to deal with this uh, beast and, uh, and hence the complexity. But at the heart of all this, as we all understand, is uh, the imbalance of power and uh, domination vis-a-vis -vis women. So whether it is physical space or cyberspace, the society decides, the society which comprises of the other half, decides how much space it wants to give you. And the moment they feel threatened, or men uh, generally feel threatened, they, they exert power and domination, and therefore hate speech, misogyny, sexism, uh, you know, comes your way. Uh, it comes in various forms, uh, you know, visually, verbally, etc., uh, etc. Et so, do we have the tools to deal with it? Is something that uh, I would like to hear from you. Yes, we are all aware we have the Information Technology Act and there are various provisions. Are they sufficient? Obviously, they are not because uh, it goes on, you know, unabated. Uh, I, I also uh, came across the German enforcement law. So it is not as if only India is grappling with it. Uh, there are other jurisdictions which are grappling with it. So, the concern there and perhaps in India will also be because I'm sure, although you want to sort of, uh, let's say, we are flying a flag for women generally and wanting to, you know, uh, ensure that uh, they're not exposed to uh, misogyny. But we also, as uh, mature indiv individuals, uh, I'm sure, uh, do not want to sort of uh, have um, through the baby with the bathwater, as they say, in the sense that you shouldn't end up uh, curtailing free speech. So any law, any framework that we bring in, uh, we need to be very, very clear that it doesn't take away 
what we want to give women because at the end of the day say a woman wants to express herself uh, cyber space is a space where she expresses herself uh, anonymously if that anonymity is taken away by any framework then an avenue is closed to her uh, and uh, therefore the delicate balance so it, day in and day out as a judge when i sit in court you know when someone says okay take this down uh, you need to battle with all this uh, free speech versus uh, the content and uh, you have two sides to the story uh, happily you people don't have to put pen to paper i have to put pen to paper like vishal has to and therefore uh, you know we face this dilemma day in and day out and i have uh, advocates on uh, the panel they would perhaps uh, sympathize with me if others don't <laughs> this is something that i face day in and day out so i don't want to break too much of uh, uh, time in the opening uh, i would intercede whenever i think you know i need to get more clarity or i need a response from you but i'd be happy to hear all of you uh, you know inform us and i would go to the extent educate us as to what all this is about so vishal back to you and the panelist we thank you so for uh, Yeah. Thank you, sir, for flagging the issue of uh, free speech and uh, the restrictions which we ought or maybe ought not to be placing on that. Uh, we request uh, Maria to please uh, begin now. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Justice Shadhar, Judge Gopne, IT for Change, and uh, lovely to have all the co-panelists here. I will try my level best um, today to voice out. Uh, the experiences of uh, women from marginalized communities um especially women who um are activists and who are very vocal in the online spaces and uh, talk about sadly for a lot of them how the law has not really worked and why they do not resort to uh, a lot of them do not resort to a legal recourse when uh, they face uh, violence and hate in the online spaces i've been working um with women who face uh, online vitriol hate etc for about 3 to 4 years now and my interactions with them uh, it has been with uh, women actresses uh, lawyers i've also spoken to politicians etc but today i'm going to limit my talk uh, to uh, marginalized women but again women who have a very strong uh, voice in the online spaces um, i'll give you a glimpse Uh, of one or two people that i have very closely interacted with or spoken to and what their experiences have been uh, with respect to online hate and how the law uh, has really turned out when they have uh, tried to approach it um to sort of just introduce as to why i am talking about the intersection in approach of course online hate uh, against us women much like abuse in the offline physical spaces is intended uh, to silence us as bhavna had begun by saying it signals to us women that our voice need not be heard that the spaces that we are occupying don't belong to us it's very important therefore to look at the intersectionality of abuse and uh, in my paper that you can read on the website as well like my area of interest to interact with women from marginalized backgrounds i bring forth how women who belong to uh, or are identified as belonging to religious uh, racial or ethnic minority groups dalit and bahujan women uh, Uh, the lgbtqi plus community and women with disabilities how we face disproportionate abuse misogyny uh, and violence online here i'd like to share with you my interview with uh, muslim uh, journalist and activist shiba aslam uh, whose case had become the talk of the town a few years ago um in august 2011 after receiving threatening emails from an unknown account uh, she filed a complaint with the cyber cell fearing for her safety she clearly told me that she had not filed an fir but the police took so much action and filed an fir against the person who was emailing her she had no idea about any of this um very interestingly shiba tells me that one evening a friend called her and informed her that an fir was filed against her in court the person who had been threatening her placed her facebook posts as a justification uh, to his warnings to her and she was stunned to see that the metropolitan magistrate discharged the man against whom she had complained of all offenses and he directed the sho in his order to register a separate fir against her and investigate her facebook posts where she had been critical of the uh, prime minister but had also been very vocal about the nirbhaya case and the whole anti uh, the, the 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 rape laws and the anti women laws in general well she filed a review petition against the order which was which discharged the man who uh, harassed her 
um, but it was met with the argument that mere use of improper words on his part cannot attract criminal consequences. And the judge at the Sazari said, and I quote, he to the best of his capability and intelligence was trying to put forth his opinion in contrast to the argument of the petitioner. And you know, you have to remember that, and of course the petition was dismissed and said to have no merit. And this gentleman in the emails had clearly stated to her that she will be met with consequences if she did not stop posting what she was posting. Um, her case went on for four years and after a lot of international pressure and media advocacy, et cetera, the charges were dropped. Um, it's very interesting to note here that Sheba was not even aware that a court case was going on in her name until one of her friends informed her. And the Facebook posts referred to uh, in order to implicate her were dated 2012 and 13, uh, while the court justified the threats made to her in 2011 based uh, on these posts. So it really rattles her still to think what, what was really happening in court at that time. And when I asked her, was she still troll for her views? And she's, I've seen her become, I mean, I, I don't see her post so much these days, but then when I ask her uh, if she would again reach out to law enforcement if something like this happens, she says, no, I will try to take up other uh, means, you know, probably report the troll or um, just block myself for some time and, you know, not interact in the cyber spaces. Because uh, clearly uh, she feels, and like a lot of other women that I interact with, feel that their identity plays a huge role uh, when it comes to um, dealing with uh, the violence and abuse that she faces. Um, a few points I want to talk about uh, when reporting online uh, abuse on different portals that have recently come up. Um, the government of India uh, launched a cyber crime reporting portal in 2019, August of 2019, to report all cyber crimes on one central platform. And uh, till November of 2020, it was reported that since its launch, the portal had received over 2 lakh complaints. And this uh, includes all kinds of complaints and not just complaints related to uh, gender-based violence, uh, stalking, etc. Out of these 2 lakh complaints, FIRs were registered in only 5,000 cases. Similarly, a dedicated email uh, at the Ministry of Women and Child Development received a mere 179 complaints in a time period of one and a half year. And I, I have this information because I wrote to um, the ministry asking how many, how many complaints have been received. I wrote to them in 2018. So from July 2016 to January 2018, a mere 179 complaints. Now, me as, as an individual, as a Muslim woman, when I sit online and I just open, say, open my Twitter and I open Twitter of a few of my friends, like if I have to see uh, Shela's tweets or say a uh, journalist like Arfa Khanam, if I open hers, or even uh, my Dalit friends like Meena Kotwal, who's an amazing journalist, the kind of vitriol they receive, I think within one hour, I can safely report seven to 800 uh, just sitting on my own. Uh, and doing uh, if I to report tweets, and these are tweets directed against their identity, of course, uh, their their Dalitness, if I may, some call them. I mean, we are all. I am called Mulli, Jihadan, Pakistani agent, all of that, and this is all against their policies. You know, I'm, we are termites. We are uh, Rohingya Bangladeshis because of our surnames. We are dirty because of our caste. So, I mean, I can sit and report four, five, six hundred within an hour myself. So it also shows. These numbers are in, in, indicative of how, despite the growing hateful content and threats against women online, especially women belonging to minority communities, marginalized backgrounds, very few really choose to resort to reporting these to government portals and law enforcement agencies. Um, a lot of my interactions, when I ask my friends and other colleagues and people I've interviewed as to why they don't, they uh, most, most of them belong to religious and caste repressed minorities. They clearly brought out their lack of trust in these mechanisms the time consuming process, the hassles associated, and also a lot of them believe that the, the fact of their identity also sort of stops them uh, from um, resorting to this sort of reporting. Um, I, am, I am not a lawyer by practice, I studied human rights law, so I'm, I'm not dwelling into too many details about the different acts and sections, etc. But I had, uh, because of my interaction with these women, also interaction with the platforms, I think it may be safe to say that uh, maybe no new uh, laws need to be enacted to address online violence and hate, but definitely a clearer definition of what constitutes hate speech, which acknowledges and addresses sexism and 
gender-based hate on the internet is required. And to look at how women from minority communities then uh, are at a higher risk and face much more, uh, maybe also needs to be integrated into this. I mean, this might be just asking for the uh, skies and moon, but why not? Um, again, based on my interaction with women from various backgrounds, I think it's safe to say that despite the threats that they face in the online spaces, most have pursued non-legal strategies to counter this hate and violence, um, giving their uh, debilitating past experience. While some ignore the hate and trolling, others block the abusers or just report them to the platforms. I'd like to conclude um, by saying that it's also, I think, extremely important to hold social media platforms accountable to act against this hate. Um, because they may, I mean, they're making millions in profit from markets like India. And to say that we entered a market like India without thinking what the human rights impact of our existence uh, in, in a country like India could be, uh, is, uh, I, I don't think it's a fair argument for them to make. So um, platforms should conduct human rights audits that include uh, a human rights risk assessment, understanding the vulnerabilities faced by minorities, especially uh, the audit should examine their hiring policies, uh, it should be updating, the, I mean, it should have uh, what, what is the kind of uh, slurs uh, that they use to filter content in, uh, in societies like India. What are, the, what are the language competencies? Because a lot of my friends, again, who belong to marginalized backgrounds tell me that we report content, extremely vile content, rape threats and death threats. But if it's in a language that is not, I mean, if it's not English, if it's in Hindi, we still have a chance of it move, being moved out. But if it's in another local language, then it's extremely, extremely difficult. A lot of us who deal with these things would know that even in English these days, our lovely trolls change the words. And, you know, artificial intelligence at Facebook and Twitter is not uh, able to uh, catch those words. For the longest time, Bob and Vagin was used by stalkers, you know, instead of boob and vagina. And artificial intelligence couldn't catch it because, you know, what is a Bob? So it was really, really difficult for us. In fact, Twitter only last year included the term caste in the policy violation. In Hindi, they had jati, but for some reason, caste did not appear in their policy violation in English. So after a lot of uh, advocacy uh, by a lot of uh, groups, the, word, the term caste was included only last year. And this is basic. This is really, really basic. Um, this human rights audit that I'm talking about is the bare minimum that must be demanded from platforms, given the disproportionate impact of hate speech on women's rights, especially marginalized women's rights to participate uh, in the online public uh, spaces. I think I'll, I'll end here, and if there's anything else that needs to be discussed, I'm happy to talk. Thank you, Maria, for the uh, you know, thoughts and also for keeping the time. Um, but I think I want to just uh, dwell and develop on uh, of course, without commenting on some of these specific cases, which may be subjudice or may have been subjudice, uh, I think you've indicated a very uh, prominent aspect of the interaction between uh, online and offline spaces, which is that the distinction seems to be blurring. We all in the recent past have proceeded on the assumption that certain things which are for private and casual conversation, it's not that they are, but they are, they do exist they get mirrored in the online spaces. So it's a social reality being mirrored in the online space. But the instances which you suggest also um, are indicative of a reverse process where the online realities have started reflected, reflecting in real life so that the consequences of, a, of an expressive person online chase him or her outside the online space, which brings us to the normative framework we were trying to you know, center this debate around, are we advocates for free speech in the, in, the, in the classic liberal sense, you know, we stand for free speech? Because the moment we start nuancing it and uh, exerting some controls, it's precisely these uh, women or the marginalized subgroups of women whose voice may also get drowned out is also a perspective which may be worth considering for the panel. So as I introduce uh, and uh, invite, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Aarti to you know, join the discussion. Perhaps one last thought from you, Maria, on this aspect of now the real life mirroring the online life. Absolutely. Um, in fact, it, it was very, very triggering for me when a lot of the people, a lot of the women I interacted with told me how it is posted, especially fake news when it's posted against them. And again, 
I've interacted with women of all categories, and I am categorically saying, based on my experiences, that it is Muslim, Dalit, LGBTQI community, where if there's a false news posted against them, they have been confronted in real life by people asking them, why is it that they say this? Or why is it that they do this? I spoke to a woman politician against whom there was a fake news about the prime minister saying that uh, uh, she, she feels that he's this and that, and she hadn't said it. it was very, the language was in very bad taste, so she doesn't use that language. She was on a train and she tells me how seven people came to her and then they asked her, they said, how dare you say this about him? And you know, it's so different when you're doing this online in the cyberspace and then you are suddenly in a real room with those trolls who actually have been abusing you and using threatening language against you, say those things to you on your face. So that space has really blurred and that is one of the reasons that we really need to uh, take this up more seriously now. Thank you, Maria. I think we've really uh, highlighted the sort of accentuated expression of uh, misogyny when we look at uh, some of the less uh, expressive or traditionally uh, allowed to be expressive groups on the online space. Um, to build on this uh, and other aspects, uh, we would now request uh, RPG um, uh, to speak. Thank you, Judge, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity of being part of today's discussion. Um, just to take off from the last point that Maria had left off on, um, and Judge Gogne touched upon, which is the degree to which online interactions manifest in our physical world. Um, I think the panelists over the last few couple of discussions as well gave us an opportunity to understand the extent of the impact that online misogynistic hate speech has on women internet users. Um, it has a, a profound impact on their mental and physical well-being, their sense of security. It also um, impairs their ability to exercise their fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression by amongst other things, making them self-censor in order to avoid such abuse. Um, but in addition to this, it's important to understand certain wider effects of online misogynistic hate speech. When such hate speech is published, it doesn't just effect, affect the community or class of people targeted by the hate speech. It is not merely a reflection of pre-existing prejudices and vulnerabilities. It also results in creating an altered reality, which reality is more toxic. So let me give you an everyday example of, uh, of this, um, something that's not even as extreme as you know, uh, violent misogynistic hate speech. Um, take your family WhatsApp groups that are inundated by wife jokes. And like these can range from the mildly sexist ones to the downright misogynistic jokes. And they all play on this familiar trope of you know, the nagging shrew-like wife and the hapless husband. A young teenage boy consuming these jokes, um, reportedly exposed to these sort of tropes and this representation of marital relations would slowly start believing that women who complain of abuse in marriages are possibly exaggerating or lying. Now, this is just a mild form of the altered reality that speech can create or that toxic content can create through the use of you know, social media platforms and wide dissemination. Um, so vicious hate speech on the, uh, on the internet that is given wide circulation has a far more detrimental effect in terms of the altered reality it creates. And um, it is this creation of this altered reality that then you know, also is transposed into the physical world that we occupy that I think must be addressed by the law. <clears throat> and um, social media platforms have long hidden behind this convenient veil of neutrality or this status of an innocent conduit. Um, Maria in her uh, presentation had highlighted the importance of you know, training the lens on these intermediaries and auditing the impact that their business has on human rights. Now, it's also important to bear in mind that this human rights impact is not some accidental or incidental outcome of um, these social media platforms. Over the years, um, there is compelling evidence that is emerging that indicates that social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit are designed in a manner that deliberately encourages hate speech. These platforms promote content that has the most engagement through their newsfeed. We all see that. So the top items on our newsfeed are the ones that have maximum user interaction. Um, now, 
detailed research has indicated that negative content or content that is driven by primal emotions such as hatred and fear prompt the maximum user engagement. So it is such negative and toxic content that gets the maximum visibility. Um, now, under ordinary circumstances, a majority of people do not subscribe to extreme or fringe views. But what happens is when you know, extreme and toxic content is given wide circulation and is promoted as a result of the algorithms that these platforms use, um, it normalizes this content in the eyes of otherwise moderate users. I mean, there have been studies that, that describe the psychological impact of the wide circulation of toxic material. And it not only desensitizes, but it normalizes such, um, such content. And how you perceive content online is influenced uh, uh, by you know, um, how many other users seem to subscribe to that view. Um, for example, uh, recently, Jack Dorsey has admitted that while Twitter was designing its interface, there was a lot of thought and um, consciousness in choosing to have the like button and the retweet button right below the tweet. So that when a user is examining the content of the tweet, they're subconsciously also influenced by how many people have liked and retweeted it. Um, so when angry misogynistic tweets get wide circulation, it creates an algorithm altered reality uh, where such views and behavior is seen as acceptable. Um, and in the context of misogynistic hate speech against women online, it then becomes necessary to consider the profile of perpetrators. Now, people engaging in this sort of toxic speech acts are not necessarily hardened and irredeemable criminals. Um, you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds of such users who engage in these speech acts, very often they are young boys or men who are just emboldened by the anonymity of the internet and influenced by the toxic content that they have easy access to. Um, and these would be people who ordinarily absent this sort of environment may not be prone to issuing rape and death threats or slut shaming women or verbally abusing women they encounter in the physical world. Um, so I think it's necessary to reflect on the extent to which this abusive online avatar of hundreds and thousands of users is a conscious creation of these platforms. And I mean, let me be clear over here, I'm not attempting to condone or justify acts of online violence be just because it's enabled or encouraged by the design of certain platforms. Uh, but I believe that this should be borne in mind while discussing a possible regulatory framework to address this violence. Um, <clears throat> Because I do feel that we would be missing the woods for the trees if our efforts was ju were just focused on punishing these people instead of stemming the publication of toxic content and speech that normalizes such abusive behavior. Um, while looking at the problem of harmful speech, it is worth also thinking about whether the retributive root of the criminal justice system with its focus on punishment and incarceration is really the solution. Um, I mean, feminist consciousness globally has um, sort of woken up to abandoning the carceral route and realizing that you're not going to get lasting social reform by just throwing men into jail. Um, more often, the process, these sort of um, criminal justice systems are abused to punish the vulnerable, and it rarely provides any sense of security or closure to the victim, which is something that uh, Maria's account also bears out. Um, so yes, uh, I mean, just to repeat, it's worth asking whether the cause of women's empowerment is served by prosecuting and imprisoning individual transgressors. Um, instead, I feel like there should be a strong regulatory focus on the culpability of platforms that are deliberately designed in a manner that promotes toxic views and content. And, and the reason they're designed in this manner is that they profit from the publication of harmful speech as a result of the wide circulation the content gets and the user base that such con uh, content attracts. Um, with that, now I wish to turn to um, the actual process of formulating the law to regulate misogynistic hate speech. Uh, now, I mean, uh, there are constitutional restrictions on the extent to which laws can be devised 
to impose restrictions on uh, the fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression. These are set out in Article 19.2. So in the context of hate speech, we need to establish that the actions that are sought to be regulated um, affect or have a detrimental impact on public order. Now, at this point, it's worth considering what the Supreme Court has said about what the test of determining what an action affecting public order is. Um, and I'd like to take you through a, a portion of a 1970 judgment of the Supreme Court in Arun Ghosh versus State of West Bengal to make my point. Uh, this was a judgment of, by Justice Hidayatullah and he sought to make a distinction between actions that only impacted law and order and those actions that had wider ramifications and um, actually affected public order. Uh, so I will just quote from a section of the judgment. Justice Hidayatullah says, an act by itself is not determinant of its own gravity. In its quality, it may not differ from another, but in its potentiality, it may be very different. Take the case of an assault on girls. A guest at a hotel may kiss or make advances to half a dozen chambermaids. He may annoy them and also the management, but he does not cause disturbance of public order. He may even have a fracas with the friends of one of the girls, but even then it would be a case of breach of law and order only. Take another case of a man who molests women in lonely places. As a result of his activities, girls going to colleges and schools are in constant danger and fear. Women going for their ordinary business are afraid of being waylaid and assaulted. The act of the man who molests girls in lonely places causes a disturbance to the even tempo of life and all women are apprehensive of their honor and he can be said to be causing disturbance of public order. Now, perhaps the most polite criticism one can offer is that this illustration fails completely in establishing the difference between an act that affects law and order and an act that affects public order. Um, speaking as a woman and as a lawyer, I must admit it's hard to discern a difference between the threat caused to repeated harassment of women employees at a hotel and a woman being harassed on a lonely stretch of the road. Both incidents, if, if it comes to light to the public, would cause women to fear for their safety, whether out and about on the streets or at workplaces. Um, and it's also not, as Justice Hidayatullah suggested, um, an action that affects a, a woman's honor. Now, you may ask why I'm quoting from a 1970 judgment, which perhaps the, you know, reflects the outmoded perceptions. But it is this very test that was quoted and affirmed in the 2015 judgment in Shreya Singhal, while striking down Section 66A, on the touchstone of whether or not um, the acts that were proscribed had an effect on public order. I don't have any quarrel with the finding that 66A was unconstitutional, it undoubtedly was. Um, but it perhaps gives us an insight on the limitations of the court, which is you know, predominantly male, upper caste male, in truly understanding, um, you know, in, in having a truly um, sort of gender just understanding of women's entitlements under the constitution. Um, and ultimately the conception of what public order is and what acts affect public order is understood through a masculinist lens. Um, so this brings me to the next issue of how to develop laws to address online gendered speech. And um, there have been panelists in these series who've expressed a degree of optimism about the role that the Supreme Court has played in um, crafting laws that regulate online hate speech or online abuse of women. And I must with respect say that I don't share their optimism. Um, in, in my paper, I've outlined in detail the deeply problematic role that the judiciary has played when it comes to judicial legislation in this space. Um, this is for three reasons. One, the inevitably masculinist, upper caste lens with which it approaches the act of judicial legislation. Um, the second is the almost neoliberal deference that it has towards enterprises, um, particularly you know, large uh, multinational corporations that, uh, you know, cre that create these uh, social media platforms in the context of regulation of online abuse. 
um so this this the court's excessive deference to private enterprises in the context of regulation of online gender abuse have had certain outcomes um one is that this perception of um, the neutrality of intermediaries and platforms is one that has been created by the courts um it is the premise on which the liability of intermediaries and shreya singhal was watered down um the second is the courts almost blind acceptance of the feasibility argument where intermediaries say that it is impossible to effectively police um the prolific content that is hosted on their platforms um it's important that these assumptions as to feasibility are countered by evidence that is emerging globally particularly in light of the fact that jurisdictions such as um you know the european union that has more robust regulatory oversight have managed to get intermediaries to turn around user complaints and respond to user complaints in far tighter timelines um i mean as as much as little as between 24 and 48 hours when it comes to user reported complaints and um finally and when it comes to the role of judicial legislation i think it's important to acknowledge that across the board not just in the context of online hate speech um it is it is by its very nature undemocratic it's conducted in a non consultative manner and it's perhaps also against the constitutional scheme because the organ of state that is tasked with um you know the, the exercise of crafting or devising legislation is the legislature and it should be left to the legislature and not to the courts um now finally i'd like to turn to what could a possible framework of laws to address hate speech in the manner that i've set out earlier look like um i have to be we may conclude in a couple of minutes if i could request yes. you yes sorry um in less than 2 minutes uh so this has to start with an acknowledgement that any proposed regulatory framework cannot be a silver bullet solution um so i'd just like to perhaps set out some broad strokes for discussion um i think it's important that um, not all hate there, there is no over regulation of speech and um, the definition of the kind of hate speech that is sought to be regulated has to be as narrow as possible and possibly only extremely aggravated forms of speech extremely violent speech and threatening speech um you know se sexually abusive videos etc must be uh, the focus of such legislation the second is that the law must do away with this perception of neutrality and pass in the principle of absolute liability on large intermediaries with massive user bases and large turnovers um that if you have created an enterprise that has you know pernicious and harmful effects then you must be held absolutely liable even if the harms that are caused are accidental or not a direct consequence of your own actions but of user actions um the law must require that such platforms take down such harmful content not just upon government or court intimation but user intimation and a failure to do so on a repeated basis must attract stiff penalties not the kind of penalties that are current um in legislative framework contemplate but closer to perhaps what the german laws contemplate which go up to 50 million dollars and actually serve as a meaningful deterrent um to these intermediaries and um the you know if if such proceedings were to be prosecuted by a public agency instead of being in response to individual victim complaints um it also takes away the you know the the problem that victims bear of bringing their complaints forward and engaging with a hugely punishing criminal justice system um so yes on that note with these broad strokes um i pass it back to you judge gogne thank you mr raghavan uh, <clears throat> uh, uh on which justice sagdev would you want to come in i i i presume you had a certain point to make sir so you are on mute presently uh so you'll have to uh, unmute yourself please uh, you're on mute yeah sorry i i forgot about uh, unmuting myself so couple of things that i just want to uh, sort of bring to fore and focus it uh, more clearly for the other panelists and maybe arthi to respond uh while uh, 
I take a couple of points. When I take a point that uh, judicial legislation is not the best way uh, to take this forward, but uh, we must realize in a country like ours, the legislature takes eons in filling up the space. All legislations are post facto, correct? But in India, the, 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 the timelines are so wide that people necessarily come to court. And uh, as lawyers, you would know that uh, the preferred route is PIL. And today, and these days, they just go to the last court and get legislation, judicial legislation, so to say, enacted. Not the most uh, appropriate way, because I realize when there is no debate, uh, you cannot uh, iterate the law. And therefore, you cannot, sitting in a courtroom with two or three or maybe five judges, decide what is best because civil society has to come in, you'll have to say something, domain experts will come. But we've had some happy experiences because they fill up the space the legislation comes in. Vishaka is a good example of what the courts were able to achieve. Had it not been for Vishaka, you would not have had the Posh Act. And therefore, you know, uh, we would have been uh, without the law on sexual harassment. So. Uh, it seems uh, that in, in the Indian context, there has to be some kind of, because when people come to court, you have to do something. You can't just say, uh, you know, I'm not going to issue any directions. I'm not going to uh, deal with the matter at all. That's one. The second point that she raised about uh, masculinist upper caste lens. Uh, my only uh, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, thought on this is that, uh, yeah, it, it does appear so to marginalize sections of the society that, uh, you know, it is the, the courts are dominated by upper caste men. But uh, I think it will be uh, a bit too extreme, for want of a better expression, to paint all men with the same brush, because uh, irrespective of your caste creed, I believe when uh, judges uh, sit in courts, uh, it doesn't matter to them which caste they belong. And I have uh, recent uh, experience will show to you that uh, uh, men have been uh, rather sensitive to issues uh, dealing with women. In fact, there is a, a statistical study done in the US where uh, Men have been, in a sense, uh, when it comes to women uh, uh, violators of the law, been, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, softer as, it, as against, uh, you know, uh, the women judges. So, I, so let's not get into this debate of uh, a masculinist lens uh, versus, uh, uh, you know, how a woman would view it. It is the degree of sensitivity that you have to the issue and therefore, I started at the beginning to say it's important to have conversations and therefore sensitize men, uh, especially the ones who are stakeholders in uh, the process of correcting these uh, gross uh, errors or uh, dehumanizing uh, approach to women. For the moment, that, that, that's my reaction to what... Uh, Sorry, if I may just briefly respond to that. Yeah. Um, while I, I do take your point that uh, judge, uh, sorry, uh, just a that uh, it's not necessary that a judge is influenced by his um, gender or caste identity. Um, I think there's a reason why the legislature is tasked with making law because of its very, it, of its representative nature. And um, on the issue of how men in, you know, have empirically been shown to go softer on women uh, wrongdoers in criminal cases, um, it's also the fact that women who rise up in the legal profession are very uh, often co-opted into the ways of patriarchy. So it's not necessary, and I must concede that more women judges uh, will result in more gender just outcomes. Sensitization is important. Um, but at the same time, I think, unfortunately, even today, we can see in our higher judiciary, a lack of gender sensitivity. Um, including, you know, recent remarks about uh, the profile of, I mean, the necessity for having women and older people as part of a protest. Um, all of it reflective of a certain degree of gender bias, which 
as both a woman as and a lawyer it makes me apprehensive about um, the ability of the judiciary to effectively um, engage in these issues when it comes to legislating so um, i i do take your point but i i must disagree Oh, that's all right. I think I I don't expect uh, people to agree with me. I'm not saying, <laughs> but uh, having said so, I still believe it's the degree of sensitivity that is important. Whoever no, the individual is, and you need to fill vacuum at times. And as I said, Vishaka is a good example of that. But anyway, let's move on because we'll get stuck into the okay. you sure. versus me and. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir, and. Uh... Uh, Mr. Raghavan, for bringing balancing perspectives in your own uh, different ways, but uh, also significant is a, a sort of uh, tussle, if I can use that word, which Arti has brought to the fore, which is that there are competing interests when we look at who should uh, police the internet. While you have business models of the big tech companies encouraging the rapid propagation of tweets and the like which if your point is taken well encourages misogynistic expression by a privileged section online on the other hand if legislation is to be brought in by those carrying precisely the mindsets which you seek to counter the control goes to the same patriarchal and power structures which you are seeking to fight so maybe this argument is at the a peril of ignoring that the internet has been a vastly liberating space for many marginalized sections so obviously these issues are very complex as to decide whether the policing or the guidelines should come in the form of community guidelines as some of the big tech companies do follow or should the governments and uh, the courts at opportune moments continue to bring in some sort of legislation but that does come With the social uh, values that we all uh, seem to be holding, as has been put forward by Mr. Raghavan. Uh, on that note, I would uh, wish to join our next speaker, Ms. Vishali Bhagwat, who uh, is also a votary. Uh, I, uh, as, as I read some of her, uh, you know, literature, of an increasing need to legislate the dormant or silent areas of the law. which may be uh, incapable of dealing with emerging online expression of misogyny for example doxing or uh, let's say revenge porn etc so in the interest of time we request her to um, take on the next segment ms bagwa thank you judge gokne honorable justice kandar and the other uh, co panelists uh, it's been an honor to be part of this discussion and i am looking forward to an opportunity also to sort of vent out my frustration as a practicing lawyer when it is, it becomes almost impossible to help victims who come to us and then we try to approach uh, the judiciary or the police mechanism or the investigating officers to give them some sort of relief or even a semblance of justice so i look forward uh, i mean i was really looking forward to this, this discussion because day in and day out we struggle with uh, archaic laws laws which, who are not responsive systems and uh, and 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 judges and judiciary and law enforcement who is not, who are not responsive and that is why i have based my paper on a couple of suggestions one is about um the lack of adequate legislation and why is there a need of a separate legislation which will encompass all these uh, rising issues uh, relating to sexist hate speech we have a lot of legislation around um, say sexual violence relating to gender based sexual violence or gender violence violence relating to women but whether there is a separate need uh to carve out a separate legislation relating to sexist hate speech is going to be one of my arguments the second argument that i would like to put forth is about uh, where online gender based sexist hate speech does form a very specific subset of hate speech and i personally feel why is it so difficult to regulate a specific subset uh, under the guise of may be protected speech and when it directly violates uh, the human rights available to women of right to to freedom of speech and expression right to life and 
right to dignity and that has that is going to be my second point of argument and as i said uh, not only inadequacy of legislation but also the implementation mechanism which almost fail to give you know sometimes i feel it is easy to sit in bombay bangalore delhi and talk about policy reforms and talk about how laws are adequate inadequate but let us but the online sphere is not limited to these metro cities you will have women uh, from villages from remote places who if for them it is impossible to get any relief when any form of uh, 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 when, when they are be, when they become victims to any form of sexist hate speech online and they're almost running from pillar to post trying to get some sort of of justice and i think all of the panelists have mentioned not only in this session but right from session number 1 that the only way women deal with it is to go away from the internet the only way women deal with any form of uh, this injustice is not participate and stop voicing their opinions i have had i have come across several such victims who shut down their facebook accounts twitter accounts and they just do not want to participate so this the, the this the, the finality of of the lack of legislation is where women just fail to I mean we are not talking of women like you know all the panelists or activists or journalists who in spite of uh, being trolled and uh, and being victims of sexist hate speech continue to voice their opinions but i want to represent the 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 more the, the public at large who find it almost impossible to to deal with uh, these forms of expressions online what i have done in in the paper that i have presented for it first changes i have gone through uh, two primarily two legislations the indian penal code and the information technology act which does talk about certain forms of hate speech it does talk of criminal intimidation and it does talk of obscenity or sexual harassment in a in a very uh, if i can say in a very narrow uh, manner most of the legislations if you see and if you analyze the sections uh, in a particular format and the format which i have used is the format that the laws have completely missed out on looking at the impact that is a certain form of speech will have on the victim the impact of emotional distress the impact of fear the impact of of uh, wanting to run away from from a medium the in, impact of uh, of perhaps going into long term depression all of that is completely missed out i think uh, both of my earlier speakers maria as well as arti did touch upon the importance of having a proper definition or a closed definition of what really a sexist or a gender based hate speech should be and i think that would resolve most of our problems so though i as i said i'm advocating uh, uh, the necessity for a completely separate piece of of legislation which will look uh, which will look at uh, all these uh, issues in totality and where the legislation can be procedural as well as substantial and and also in my paper i have also discussed the need for an alternative dispute resolution mechanism where approaching a forum for justice will 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 make it easier for women to do so and i think maria also i highlighted that in in her presentation that women do not and let us accept that they do not go to the police station uh, for registering their complaints they do not come to courts for relief they just suffer in silence and that is why we have seen uh, after the enactment of the protection of women from sexual harassment at workplace and the immense success that it has had because it talks of confidentiality it talks of non retaliation and it talks of an internal redressal mechanism where women feel there is a safe circle that they can approach for protection of their rights and something uh, uh, a mechanism which would be similar to what has been offered under posh act is something that needs to be considered uh, it with utmost urgency when it comes to issues dealing with women uh, as i had earlier said in in, in when i opened this um, getting a woman to file an fir and even if you do convince her that that is the only way 
that she will get any form of justice by the time she reaches the police station or even the magistrate's court for an investigation order the damage is done and the cause is lost internet is such a medium that because of of, uh, of the of the inherent capability of the medium to circulate uh, images uh, content uh, at a pace where the damage is is immediate and long lasting and permanent um, it's almost a lost cause uh, saying that these laws are enough women needs to file more fir and fir after that fir is filed um, the cases need to be taken up on priority i practice in 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 district court sessions court and also the high court we all know what go uh, the kind of the, the system that we have at the sessions court and the district court level imagining uh, that instant relief will be given to victims for take down is merely on paper uh, we've again all talked about the shreya single judgment and how uh, uh, the provisions have been watered down uh, so that the platforms are no longer under a liability to remove content on and i think napinay also made a very strong point when she spoke about uh, platform liability for take down of content uh it is not that platforms are not liable to take down content however there if they fail to take down content their shield remains the protection shield remains and then what do the victims need to do the victim needs to get a court order or government intervention now as i said this just looks very good on paper uh women who are not in metropolitan cities are not in large cities let me tell you from practical experience it is impossible to get a take down order from a magistrate's court uh, in the in the urgency that the take down is required and as, and that is why i said you know sometimes all all these discussions become very easy when you are sitting in large cities and talking about policy reforms uh, coming to a little bit to the the paper which uh, and i would like to read out a few things in terms of the reforms which i have uh, which i i i i i try i'm trying to uh, say that are necessary and first and foremost is the specific the requirement for a specific separate legislation that will regulate all forms of gender based violence online and yes uh, i i i do i'm i'm a firm believer that offenses that are committed online need to have a separate and a better treatment especially when it comes to implementation so at least the implementation mechanisms have to be uh, more robust more online in nature and not in, not in, uh, so for example um, the it act appoints adjudicating officers uh who are uh, who are secretaries to the minister information technology of every state with special powers to pass orders under provisions of the information technology act and we all know most of the offices of the adjudicating officers are almost defunct when it it comes to passing of any orders under the information technology act uh on the other hand civil courts jurisdiction stands ousted under the information technology act and again uh victims are need to run again from pillar to post trying to get any form of an order from the adjudicating officer funnily uh you have special adjudicating officers under information technology act to look at offenses that are done online and perhaps that was the last tribunal and from what i can say from the state of maharashtra we still do not have online hearings the pendency of cases are right from 2012 2014 where so 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 where so where do where does one go for for any form of relief and that is why as i said i am a firm believer of a completely separate mechanism when it comes to um to any offenses done online so i've i'm i've i've talked about a separate legislation i have talked about specific provisions that sh that should be made to criminalize uh any form of messages and posting of material online that cause serious emotional distress discomfort humiliation and loss of dignity fear or even incitement to suicide 
Now, this impact uh, model is completely missing in, under IPC as well as IT Act. I'm not going to specific provisions because I've made a sort of given sort of an analysis of all the sections uh, in the paper that I've presented. A robust definitions, I think we, we all sort of agree on that. And the legislation, another, uh, another thought that I wanted to put forth is we all also believe that we are better behaved when we are watched. And this is, this is, this is just a norm of any human behavior. And therefore, uh, if, if uh, there is, if, if societal change is to be brought in terms of how, how the subject is even looked at, a strong, robust legislation and an equally robust implementation is the requirement of the day. And any day's delay, which, which we already are too late into even having a conversation like this, is really, is really almost adding a premium to the perpetrators. What our laws have also completely missed out is, you know, we always talk of criminalizing these acts, but why not even have adequate civil remedies like restraining orders, protection officers, um, provisions to award damages, compensation, hefty fines, uh, so that the victims feel that uh, there is a better way of approaching uh, a subject like this. There is enough deterrent to perpetrators when uh, they actually have to shell out money for compensation and, the, and uh, 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 the basis on which compensation can be claimed by a victim is not new to law. There have been so many legislations, so many judicial pronouncements which talk of an exact way of quantifying compensation and it is never uh, awarded in an ad hoc manner. So um, again, Bhagavad, civil remedies... Can I, uh, can I request you to also please take a couple of minutes to uh, wind up. We will have follow-up questions. And yes, sir. Since, so I'll, I have, I'll... Since, and since I have intervened, I'll uh, uh, take the uh, you know, opportunity also to draw you to the uh, intermediary guidelines because I believe that uh, a, a counterpoint to that also would be delivered by Ms. Pandari. Because as we look to uh, you know, regulate all the instances of misogynistic expression and seek to criminalize, and as you say, let's not over criminalize, uh, there are suggestions of using algorithms to detect proactively so that the victim is not at every instance brought into the system of being, uh, as you say, put to the rigors of the you know, investigation system. So uh, are these algorithms not taking the question of regulation of private speech or let's say determination of offending content to a private player? Uh, how, does, how does an algorithm work in the in the enhancement of the value that we have in mind? Um, actually, the um, uh, very, very valid point, uh, Judge Govne, about algorithms and this, in fact, in the earlier sessions also, so much was spoken about uh, using automated technology for filtering unlawful content. Uh, however, the, the question still comes back to the definition of unlawful content has to be, it has to be very specified, specific, and it has to minimize subjectivity and the, the scope of interpretation of unlawful content has to be very narrow. Uh, only then algorithms would be able to, to filter out content which, is, which will amount to sexist hate speech. And I think as of now, uh, uh, that is what is completely missing. Uh, platforms have also not engaged in uh, looking at content which is in vernacular and it is it is it's very it's very language based and it's it's based primarily English based and that is where uh, we see intermediaries faltering. One of the point that uh, I would like to make in intermediary regulation is as of now, though there are stringent mechanisms, uh, even, Shreya, even the Supreme Court has laid down guidelines in the Shreya single judgment and the amended intermediary. Uh, guidelines which are impending. Uh, the only manner in which intermediaries can be asked to strictly adhere to uh, to take down notices or take down uh, orders or even have community guidelines tweaked or uh, or drafted in a way that appeal to the the cultural sensitivity of the country that they operate in. 
uh, and not bring on the cultural sensitivity of the country that they are registered in, uh, because then that defeats the entire purpose. And unless and until severe penalties are not slapped on platforms, uh, this entire debate really, the, again, has no value. Uh, right now, we all know uh, takedown orders are very, very regularly flouted by platforms. And the entire, uh, the, the entire posture of platforms is as if they are above the law. Uh, we also see in investigations, intermediaries are very, very reluctant or platforms are very reluctant to even give information to investigation authorities when it comes to investigating a crime or, uh, or a crime relating to content or, or it, uh, where the content has originated. And hence, it is very important that not only there needs to be specific legislation around it, but also ensure that the intermediaries are uh, regulated by prescribing severe penalties, which is completely absent as of now. And though uh, 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 Section 79 talks about uh, the uh, even the criminal liability of an intermediary uh, when uh, due diligence is not followed, most of the times it is merely on paper. Uh, in, uh, platforms also do not have fully functional offices uh, within the country. And I think uh, one of the discussions also has been around uh, the, the mandatory requirement of having a presence within the country that they operate if a user base is above a, a certain number of users. Uh, so that is my take on intermediary regulation. I know I have already exceeded my time, so I'll stop here. And maybe if there is a, some counter argument to be made, I can come in again. Thank you. Um, sir, would you be uh, making a point here or at the end? Uh... Uh, sir, you're on mute, uh, but I presume you'll be speaking. Uh... Uh, no, I think we shall uh, let the last speaker uh, right. finish because it'd be unfair right. for me to occupy uh, time. And then we can extend a little if necessary. Sure. Sir. Yeah. So, so we've uh, kind of left off on uh, both uh, an issue of the law and also of norms. Because if intermediaries are uh, given, let's say, uh, a go ahead to determine uh, what is uh, offending content and that too on algorithms, it does bring into play the, the value system. Uh, you, you refer to community guidelines, but uh, none of us have the argument that uh, some of our own uh, values are, let's say, more progressive than some of the jurisdictions or uh, countries from where the community guidelines of the big companies are coming from. So uh, continuing the point about not throwing the you know, baby out with the bathwater, as uh, Shara mentioned in the beginning, the, uh, the question of intermediaries <clears throat> getting a sort of uh, free hand and then also bringing them under the, uh, the fist of the state in the matter of determining what is offensive content may have some unintended uh, consequences for other groups. Uh, I know this debate is certainly about uh, the gender perspective and misogynistic speech, but there are uh, equally, uh, maybe more so in some contexts, vulnerable groups whose expression on the online space may get hampered precisely because of the intermediary guidelines which we are seeing from the gender lens at present. Perhaps the next speaker, Ms. Bandari, also has a thought process to project in somewhat similar lane. Uh, way. So uh, welcome to you, Ms. Bhandari, and uh, we have about 10 to 12 minutes uh, with you. Yes, please, um, If let me know if I'm going over time and I'll try and shorten, um, I'll try and shorten it. I'll try and capture everything um, that you've sort of spoken about and maybe share some thoughts on that and on other issues that are there as part of the paper, which I, I think they'll be able to share in the chat box. So, I mean, I think just to start off, you know, it's clear that online abuse is something that disproportionately affects uh, women, minorities, um, low, you know, uh, Dalits. There's a, Amnesty, for instance, did a report that looked at the Twitter abuse on women politicians, and the results was astounding. So not only were women politicians in India uh, abused, you know, many, many more times than their male counterparts, but even within the women politicians, there's then a further, you know, the targeting is much worse depending on if you're Muslim, if you're seen as being more likely to speak out 
against the prevailing norms. And so there is a lot of online abuse and that has to be regulated. Now, the response to that is twofold. Either you look at it from a legal criminal side, so let's have more criminal laws, or you look at it from the intermediary side that let's impose um, you know, greater obligations on intermediaries. And some of these obligations, as we've sort of discussed, it's either creating backdoors to encryption. So the Rajya Sabha ad hoc committee recently said that, you know, we see that child sexual abuse content online is a real problem. We should then, you know, they recommended that we should create backdoors to break encryption. Um, it has, you know, creating, imp uh, implementing automated technology, AI filtering systems, um, ask intermediaries to proactively identify illegal content. We see this also through a, a lot of case law that's happening in the Supreme Court, whether it's Prajwala, whether it's Sabu Matthew. Um, so all of these initiatives are then imposing a lot of obligations on intermediaries. So you have one issue, which is uh, criminalization, and one issue, which is intermediaries. And sort of what I have tried to explain in the paper is there is no one silver bullet, right? There are problems with all of these approaches and we have to look at a more holistic solution while recognizing the unintended consequences of any of these actions. Um, and that's sort of what I'll be speaking about. Um, so for instance, when we look at the initiatives to increase intermediaries and having creating backdoors to encryption. So the whole sort of it's framed on this idea of child sex exploitation is bad. That's also the Prajula judgment online, you know, the online video circulating of women being gang raped is a problem. We need to regulate that. So intermediaries will proactively filter content. Um, with the Rajya Sabha committee, it was, uh, you know, child pornography is being circulated. So we need to create backdoors to end encryption. All of these then have these consequences that if you weaken encryption once, if you actually create a backdoor to encryption, it means you are introducing a vulnerability in the system. And when you introduce a vulnerability in the system, it affects everybody because we all benefit from a secure and private and encrypted chat service. So when you introduce a vulnerability, you actually can potentially undermine the privacy and encryption of all the users. Um, so that is one problem. And it also doesn't look, I mean, in other papers I've written in detail about the encryption issue. Um, but for instance, it doesn't look at other alternatives, which is metadata that is then collected by law enforcement agencies, which allows them to do a lot of things. Um, you know, we also know that law enforcement agencies have the ability to break encryption, actually. I mean, we know that as a matter of fact, we saw this even in the US in the Apple FBI case. And so one suggestion in that context is you introduce something like the US, which is a formal vulnerabilities equities process. So you introduce some sort of legal regulation around breaking encryption, if that's what law enforcement agencies are doing anyway, to introduce oversight. However, you know, uh, as you spoke just, Justice Gogne about also the problem with AI based filtering mechanisms. I mean, you know, you were talking about that. So this is a real issue because we are then talking about having these AI based filtering mechanisms without talking about questions of what happens when we privatize and automate censorship functions. How will things like algorithmic accountability work? The discussion in India is really about, at this stage, how AI is amazing. We haven't reached that stage of discussion, which is now happening in other parts of the world, about algorithmic accountability, about explaining the algorithms, about you know the black box that exists when companies make these decisions, and who that discriminates against. I've just sent a link to an article in the chat box. It's a very simple example, um, but it, you'll see two images. Um, and Instagram censored one image of this beautiful, fair, thin model, um, you know, covering herself in this very uh, elegantly posed photo. And when the same photo was taken, like the same pose is taken by a woman who's fatter, they then blocked that. Um, there are lots of articles if you see how black people are treated on the internet, right? Versus white people in terms of how the automated censorship and filtering works. Um, so I think these are things one has to be very careful about when we're talking about um, automated censorship. And also the other thing with AI-based filtering mechanisms is they are context blind. So for instance, Facebook had this huge controversy recently because the photo of the Napalm girl, the Vietnam War of Terror photo where that girl is running nude in response to the attack, they flagged that as a picture that violates nudity standards. But that of course ignores the context in which that photograph was taken. So that is one issue when we're talking about AI filtering systems, we should realize that they're context independent. Um, so there is again a huge debate about when you show breastfeeding mothers, what is the, you know, is any exposure of the, of the breast, does that mean it has to be taken down? Is it, if you only show a nipple that ha it has to be taken down? So these are issues that show that it's not as simple a question. 
you also have other suggestions that have happened in india so in india we recently seen the government establish a system of asking individuals to sign up as cyber warriors and the government is saying you know this will help us identify and report illegal content now according to me this is a very very dangerous system in a country where we know patriarchal moral vigilantism exists giving this much power to citizen cyber warriors is i think very problematic um another sort of thing you know people talk about is okay have identification re- requirements remove all anonymity because as we know anonymity can lead to a lot of trolling but again you have to look at the counterpoint or the unintended consequence that anonymity is very very important for people who come from sexual minorities who come from uh, you know political speech i mean we've seen how important anonymity is for political speech nowadays so i think that's just one issue to consider when we look at the intermediary side now what happens when we look at the criminal law side um one of the issues that i've spoken about in the paper is that the focus on criminalizing online hate speech ignores the misuse that is possible due to you know the broad wordings of the provision due to the arbitrary application and the fact that these laws are being applied in an often um patriarchal system um i have just sending another link to a paper that i have written recently which looks into a lot of detail about how when courts use gender right concerns so things like protecting women protecting indian culture how that leads to digital rights litigation so these concerns of protecting women these well intentioned concerns also often end up undermining digital rights in many cases so the paper is a deep exploration of just case law so it's a quite a legal um, he- like a law heavy paper and it looks at things like regulating ott online you know online platform content banning pornography um you know hostile discrimination in terms of access to mobile phones between men and women so this is just to say and one of the things we speak about in the paper is 66a which is now so you know abused and everyone recognizes there were problems with 66a actually started out by as a provision it was defended by the government and justified by the government um as protecting women for online abuse and we've seen how it's been misused to suppress legitimate speech and hate speech so you know we have many people who say we need separate laws so i want to give an example of section 509b an amendment to the ipc in chatisgarh which actually looks to regulate online sexual abuse which is what a lot of people talk about but how, how is the law worded it's very easy to say yes we should criminalize online sexual abuse but what does that mean in a legal provision so the law says it criminalizes the making of obscene lewd lascivious filthy or indecent com- comments online with an intent to harass or cause annoyance or mental agony to the victim now the terms obscene lewd lascivious they are not new in indian law they are built upon our existing criminalized criminal provisions around obscenity and sexually explicit speech that are there in the it act and the ipc there is a lot of writing around how this is predicated on you know victorian notions of public morality the idea of any representation of sexuality is bad you know the sexually explicit uh, representations corrupt decent people um and so you know there are issues with that language we also saw recently the kerala police act the amendment that had been proposed 118a which was again any speech that is threatening abusive humiliating or defaming um you know is also criminalized so this it's very easy to say let's criminalize but what is the actual language of the criminal law is i think very very important then we have another issue which is the fact that the you know the problematic underpinnings of all our laws in terms of obscenity is then accompanied by a side stepping of issues of consent consent so we actually have a lot of people speaking about 67 and 67a one of the provisions that i think doesn't get enough positive attention is 66e because 66e keeps consent at the heart of the provision so it says when there is a violation of privacy that is against the consent of an individual that is an offense so it's not just something that is obscene or explicit but it is something that is contrary to my consent but even then research has demonstrated so there's a fantastic paper that looks at all the litigation around 6767a in terms of uh, registration of firs and it shows that 67 is used as a catch all offense it's used for cases that have little to do with sexuality or uh, obscenity but more to do with political speech criminal intimidation breach of peace um and so not only are 67 and 67a misused we also find that police register cases of violation of consent and privacy as 67 offenses rather than 66e once again erasing the harm that is done in terms of uh, you know loss of privacy in the paper i don't know if i have time but in the paper i have actually highlighted two or three specific cases where these provisions were misused so 509b chatisgarh mohammad zubair who's the founder of alt news was recently before both the delhi high court and the chatisgarh high court because um 
his tweet, he had tweeted an, a person, you know, he's a target of abuse on social media. And uh, so, so the, I'm not going to go into those cases because I think I don't have time. But so there's a case of Mohammed Zubair. There was a case of Prashant Kanoja, who's a journalist um, who had uh, shared a news clip of a woman giving an interview to journalists that she had sent a marriage proposal to Yogi Adityanath. And he had shared a video with a comment that if chupate se, uh, chupta nahi, chupane se Yogi ji. And then he was charged with 500 IPC, 66, 67 IT Act. Um, we see even now that 67 and 67A have been used to register FIRs against women, um, you know, against producers for the objectionable content on web series, etc. So I think where I would just like to broadly end is on two points. We should have some cause of concern before we advocate for new criminal laws. Before introducing any offense, new offense, we should ask ourselves three questions. First, are the current laws actually inadequate to address the act that is sought to be criminalized? Or do they in any manner fail to take into account the harm experienced by women? Because we do have to see that there is a lot that is there in criminal law. So, you know, criminal law, uh, it criminalizes speech that is defamatory, hateful, obscene, sexually explicit, insults the modesty, intrudes upon her privacy, anonymous criminal intimidation, online stalking, sexual harassment, voyeurism, the non-consensual sharing of sexual images online, which is, you know, quote unquote called revenge porn. Actually, 354C, the first explanation covers that perfectly. Um, so we do have a lot of laws. Even the NCRB database, if you see it, they record cyber crimes against women under the heads of like cyber blackmailing, cyber pornography, cyber bullying, defamation, etc. The interesting thing is in 2019, there were only 8,379 cyber crimes reported against women. And we all know that's not because we don't have a lot of laws. That speaks to what all the other speakers have spoken about, which is the problem with, you know, underreporting, the problem with accessing the legal system, how women are treated when they go to file a complaint. And so instead of just you know, focusing on creating new laws, the government should also focus on creating public awareness, improving implementation of existing laws, you know, gender, sen gender sensitizing the state machinery um, you know, by building in a gender perspective in the law. So if you see, again, the paper that I had written, which I've mentioned about, we have spoken to you, uh, I have, we have spoken about, like the, we've given an example of a sessions judge in West Bengal who re you know, really understood the problem with non-consensual sharing of sexual uh, sexual images online. I mean, called it revenge porn, but saying you don't always need constitutional courts. You don't always need high words and you know high-flying jurisprudence. Actually just applying principles. There are great examples of how these things, recognizing the harm that uh, women face. So that's the first question. The second question is, what are the wordings of the proposed offense? Because we don't want an offense that could be worded in a vague or overbroad manner that can, you know, that is then intended to stop an illegal act actually promotes misuse. And the third is, are there other legal and non-legal alternatives that can better address this online hate speech problem? And in the paper, and because of shortage of time, I'm not going to go into it. We have spoken about certain other um, legal alternatives, like some sort of co-regulatory system, you know, maybe focusing on harms, um, as well. So that's what is happening in UK. They have this online harms white paper of 2019. Germany has this Ned, uh, Ned Z DG law, which Justice Shakhtar also, I think, spoke about, which has a focus on improving takedown processes, improved transparency by platforms. Um, so, you know, co-regulatory approach is one thing. There are also alternative to legal methods. So, you know, things like also building social norms, building pressure being put on platforms by advertisers, civil societies, employees of technology companies also. You have these multi-stakeholder initiatives such as the Santa Clara principles. Um, so there are other alternatives and I think it's important to stick together. So the UNESCO says a very interesting thing. It says primarily focusing on repressive criminal measures may misunderstand the complexity of the situation and miss out an opportunity for a coordinated and holistic response. And I think this is best seen in the criminal law reform committee that has been the subject of a lot of discussion because you have the committee by five upper caste you know, men, Hindu men, um, and you've got no representation by the people who are actually experiencing the law on a day-to-day -day basis, who are experiencing the violence of the law on a day-to-day -day basis. And then this committee is going to you know, suggest an overhaul of all criminal law in the country. So we need stakeholder consultations, more widespread consultations also. Um, so I'll just keep it short. I know I've probably stretched on just a bit. So I think for right now, um, that's it. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Brinda. Um, before we go to the comments from uh, Justice Shagdar, I would just uh, wish to sort of conclude the thread of uh, what you were saying. Um, we said in the beginning that this session is as much about the norm setting potential of the laws, because after all, we're talking about the feminist perspectives of the law. We're looking for transformative 
you know, a transformation in the conception of the state and its structures and the social structures. So from what you said, I could uh, identify two um, strains which are capable of norm setting. One is the question of threshold at which the newer offenses or the proposed transgressions get triggered. How low do we set the threshold? Because if the threshold is too low, and if we say that let's punish the most extreme of offenses, let's punish only those offenses which have a tendency, let's say, towards violence. We are uh, getting closer to the sedition law and traveling away from what we were seeking to challenge, patriarchy, power, control, and privilege. That may be manifested with uh, a comment which is far above the little threshold of, you know, tendency to create violence against the subject who's been abused. So as a norm, uh, somewhere when this discussion develops and goes to legislation, it may have to be thought about whether a lower threshold misses, you know, the opportunity to set a norm for challenging patriarchy as such. That's one. The second was the question of backdoors. As you uh, highlighted that to share, uh, uh, you know, the background encryption codes and uh, information about identity of the transgressor would also be violative in sorts about a key element or a value which didn't get mentioned as such, but which is privacy. And I'm sure Justice yes. Shaddar, who often speaks on uh, the law related to privacy would appreciate. Privacy or the recognition of it has also been a very hard fought, hard fought battle. Maybe just three to four years old as far as recognition goes in the Indian context. And the feminist critique of Privacy is that it's a veneer, and I think uh, uh, I may credit uh, Anita Ji's piece I had read some time back for this uh, little point I'm making here, that it's a veneer for covering patriarchal dominance. And it's not out of the respect for the female autonomy or gender or dignity that we are talking about privacy. So when we provide backdoors, backdoor encryption or identity sharing, it may compromise the the privacy of the subject we are seeking to, to protect. Again, very difficult issues, but as the, de the debate develops as it has in the last three sessions, these are aspects which will have to be seen. The other aspect is purely about application of the law, and that is also something on which a question came up from uh, one of the participants as to why the IT Act is not invoked as much as it should be. Now, here I could uh, offer from my experience that yes, indeed, uh, um, when offenses are investigated, which have an online dimension, the investigating officers are more likely to resort to 354A or C or D or 509, and they may, they may miss what you call a bucket all you know offense of 67. But uh, I do see that courts take notice. You know, when charge sheets are filed, uh, probably uh, or at the stage of charge, one or the other stakeholder is likely to point out that this provision was not invoked. So therefore, uh, nothing near optimum, but there seems to be a move among investigating officers and certainly the courts to take recourse to the ITI provisions. But I take your point that it's certainly not uh, enveloped as much into the investigation as it ought to have been. So uh, thank you very much for your wonderful thoughts. Uh, and uh, sir, over to you. I think uh, we've kept you waiting for the point to really make. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vishal. Having heard uh, the panelists, uh, it's obvious that uh, all of us are not on the same page, <laughs> which is which is again a happy uh, result because that's what uh, debate is all about, and then we can have an iteration as to what is the best way forward. But the debate has to be on a larger canvas; it can't be just uh, you know five or six people. Uh, there have to be, as uh, Brinda put forth, um, you know other stakeholders uh, for marginalized sections who actually experience the effect of this abuse on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, offline as well as online. Now, Maria made uh, an important point. I mean, just to highlight this aspect of the matter, Maria said, as I understood, uh, that, you know, although she started with the caveat that she's not a lawyer, but, you know, with her experience, she said, maybe we don't need a new law what we need is uh, uh, non-legal remedies. Now, that was Maria's take. And she made an important point where she said, perhaps we should look at uh, you know, a human rights audit 
of uh, these uh, intermediaries, uh, these platforms. Seems like a good suggestion. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, Vaishali had another take, and she said, uh, you know, we should have a special legislation. Uh, she went to the extent of saying uh, maybe a alternate dispute resolution. Whereas uh, Brinda, in her uh, exposition, pointed out uh, the weaknesses, uh, perhaps, uh, or maybe, as I understood, she, did, she she was not really for a special uh, legislation. So the so the take I have is that I have a very dim view of uh, you know having too many of these uh, ADRs and tribunals. We've seen what has happened with tribunals, uh, you know both as judges and as well as lawyers that uh, after a point they get so flooded they don't know how to deal with it and uh, they get desensitized instead of getting sensitized because day in and day out if you deal with the same thing your uh, level of uh, sensitivity uh, gets uh, deadened that's my uh, you know view so i would perhaps stick with what we have but certainly um if there is enough robust debate uh sort of uh, if someone would ask me to tweak the existing law for example section 79 uh, perhaps could be tweaked so that we uh, bring in more accountability where media platforms are concerned we could perhaps add penalties not by uh, guidelines and rules that is subordinate legislation but in the act itself so that there is no disconnect and therefore uh, you know media platforms are very very strong and they have deep pockets you will always find uh, when uh, facebook uh, twitter is a defendant you have the best lawyers in the country coming up and uh, defending them and saying you know uh, we will take down if you pass an order but we will we'll not do anything on our so as uh, brinda pointed out and as maria pointed out that uh, ai ha- ai as it is presently as its own uh, limitations she gave that example of how people work around maria gave us an example of how people work around ai by using expressions which are very close to abuse but they are not exactly so they don't have uh, ai doesn't have a mind of its own and they can't do it and the lack of sensitivity when you don't have a human interface they don't even understand how to deal with this so i in fact uh, the german law gives us an insight as to how we should move forward i mean it, it isn't perfect where they have actually made this as an enforcement code where they have taken uh, upon uh, enforcing through this special legislation existing uh, you know uh, german criminal codes which are 21 in number i understand and they have also uh, there are also suggestions and uh, i was reading that uh, the green party there has suggested that uh, when uh, media platforms deal with their community standards there will be people who lodge complaints and there will be people uh, both those whose content has been removed and those whose contents have not been removed what you could do is it's a good suggestion that you could have a repository where you have uh, the complaints filed for and against put in a repository and that repository can be placed before uh, you know an expert body who would then look at it as to how the media platform has dealt with it and if it has not dealt with it fairly maybe we could have uh, you know fines uh, so that we make them accountable and heavy fines so that's that's perhaps a good way and in that sense compensate the victim see at the end of the day uh, criminalizing it uh, won't take you too far but if you have graded punishments which is uh, you know starting with counseling uh, then if it's a repeat offender maybe uh, a higher punishment and then uh, you know taking off his account uh, sort of a monetary fines both on the person who has uploaded the content and even the media platform because according to me what uh, intermediaries are doing because of the protection that they get under section 79 they don't even remove what is obviously an abuse they give you some vague uh, vague uh, reasons that you know we don't have the uh, wherewithal we don't have the manpower and therefore we can't do it uh, and this is this this therefore can best be approached 
by uh, looking at uh, experiences in other countries, looking at their legislation, and tweaking the existing uh, IT code uh, or the Information Technology Act, um, maybe uh, the IPC as well. Uh, which also brings me to the point that uh, Arti made that uh, it should be done through courts. Uh, because you know, judgment law has its own problems. So the best way forward is uh, for you people to talk. And I, I take Rinda's point that uh, you don't have to go to constitutional courts. You have to do it at the lowest level because the interface in uh, you know smaller towns is, is with the magistrate. The point that uh, one of the panelists brought out is that we sit in these uh, metropolitan cities and make policy, make law without realizing how it is uh, enacted in uh, you know, old towns, smaller towns, et cetera, et cetera. So the best way is to have these uh, kind of forums, maybe open forums, not only, uh, you know, uh, we do it on VC, we can't do it on VC, but at the moment we are constrained because of COVID, but actually go to these towns and cities, get the magistrates, the magistrates over there, and have them understand what people go through. So, uh, you know, uh, Otherwise, you'll have a situation like uh, what the Supreme Court experienced. This, this business of filing an Article 32 petition in the Supreme Court directly, according to me, has uh, these kind of consequences. In fact, if you had gone to the High Court, there would have been uh, some kind of moderation because the next court would have had a view of you know, the High Court or, uh, and then maybe uh, not struck it down only on the ground of violation of Article 19, uh, 19.1a on overbreadth, and realize that there are there is some merit in what uh, the state was saying and preserved some part of it, or read down the law in a fashion that while it uh, allows for free speech, but doesn't become an instrument of abuse. So, so uh, that's that's my broad view on this, Vishal. Thank you, sir, for uh, bringing to bear your uh, experiences, suggestions, really, on you know the, the greater viability of tweaking laws uh, at the outset rather than going for a overhaul. And secondly, um, employing graded mechanisms, including also the options of uh, counselling. And uh, I'm sure, sir, you draw upon your own experience uh, with the Juvenile Justice Committee, which you had in Delhi, on uh, mechanisms lesser than penalisation, which often work when you have a graded sequence of uh, you know transgressions being uh, reported so thank you very much sir for your intervention and inputs um, uh, one quick last point maybe from anita ji um, who is the uh, organizer really of this program and uh, we could close for the uh, evening anita i'm just going to take one and a half two minutes not more than that so firstly thank you very much for an enriching discussion the series has been very illuminating and we uh, really had a beautiful, uh, you know, beginning, uh, I should say not really a finish to the series, but beginnings to a new conversation with the presence of uh, such an erudite uh, panel. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the, the reason the law becomes center stage to any feminist endeavor is because of the ideas of citizenship, which uh, in political theory are not ossified in time, right? Claims cannot be ossified or frozen in time. They arise in socio-temporal contexts of injustice. So as the world changes, the idea of uh, injustice changes. And that is why there are these new claims. And, and uh, as uh, somebody you know, who is a very famous feminist lawyer pointed out once to me, for all you young people, you know, that was when I was younger, you know, for all you young people, mm -hmm. the ideas of you know, a new law, you know, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a heady proposition. We are the people who have really seen new laws in this country, and we think you know they've they've really not achieved very much. But that pessimism, I think, is something people carry after they try to knock at the doors of uh, uh, social institutions. So, as people who care and as feminists, I think we do need to be alert to new contours of injustice in society, the new shape of power and power relations in uh, digital society. Of course, it's always institutional power and the power of non-state actors who are self-appointed, you know, that needs unpacking and real life is not just mirrored in the online, real life extends uh, online. Just a second, I need to plug in my uh, charger.
apologies. I think I had to do that uh, as somebody, you know, who is also equally, I think, performing for the online. So the truth is that the reality of digitality and the reality of digitally mediated life uh, uh, in, in some ways uh, is different today. And so what we want to understand here is how structures in this new digital reality parse out the public and private and our view of public and private. So I think the regulatory focus on platforms as this uh, series has uh, pointed out is not just about ethics and responsibility, it is also about culpability and liability. Um, I think uh, Brinda's case is very, very convincing. It makes one really think about the complications, um, but I also uh, feel that the failure of the law is not a case against the law. It is indeed a case for re-examining how the process of justice can be reinvented. And sometimes I think we need to see the law itself as a proxy for a society's normative and ethical substance. So um, the concern here is something that I want to place before everybody in our conversation, which is that you know, virtuality or digitality have vitiated something foundational. They have pushed the compass towards gender conservatism self-censorship and a permissive culture for sexist vitriol that some women bear much more than others. But all women almost always bear in a dehumanization and sexualization that signal a slip back on the gains that we have made, I would say in the past three to four decades. So we are actually, uh, we're not grappling with the idea only of feminist ideas of justice, but we are grappling with a kind of a crisis or an emergency that has acquired a gendered uh, form truly. So, I mean, without ado, we, I just wanted to share that we have been doing research, which we hope to share very soon on case law analysis of gender-based violence in digital uh, spaces over the past decade, almost you know, 2011 to 2019 or so. And uh, this is in the high courts and the Supreme Court. And we can clearly see gaps in the law visible through a mismatch between what police officers are reading as offense, the language of the law and, and the interpretation of the courts. And this is like Vaishali pointed out, not just about sexist speech, but uniformly across the board for all of uh, gender violence. And uh, courts are demonstrating a complete inability, we feel, to reasonably apply legal provisions, recognizing the experiences uh, that damage uh, women's dignity. And uh, especially when there is a public component, which as Aarti pointed out, is something that historically is, is a very complicated idea for patriarchal society to grapple with. What I'm very optimistic about is that in terms of reimagining both the procedural and substantive aspects of uh, justice, I think we've moved closer to understanding the dimensions of injustice. I think, and that I think is a step forward. I really thank today's panel in flagging many of these, uh, not the least, you know, the idea of uh, graded penalties, civil remedies, including recourse to options through platform obligations as with the German Nets DG, which is greater liability for non-transparency. Uh, the way in which Facebook files its report uh, in Germany is very different from how it files its quarterly uh, transparency reports. So I think if you demand greater transparency and make it part of the law of the land, and I think that capitalism is also part of the institutional structures for feminism. I think the second agreement we've all had is clarity in the taxonomy of the offense. At minimum, we do need this. And I think the last, uh, thought I have I want to leave everybody with is this quandary about automated decision making and this is a conversation I'd really love to have with all of you especially with Vrinda. Um, I think what we need to know from actual research is how many takedowns have helped uh, non-consensual circulation of intimate images, what proportion of errors have we actually seen and what modalities do we have to remedy that error margin right we have to actually not only talk uh, in generalities about uh, the complexities of automated decision making. We have to sit down and see, and it's very easy that data is there with the platforms. We have to mandate that the data be shared. So how many takedowns happened? How many of them really helped women? How many of them were misrepresentations of, uh, you know, a miscarriage of justice in terms of a curtailment of freedom? And what can we do to set right something that, uh, which is, you know, automated will perpetually uh, generate as error, right? So that error margin, how do we remedy? How do we uh, fix? And why do I say this? Uh, because in a world that's shaped by digital intelligence with every event on platforms being definitively shaped by algorithms, it would be a hugely skewed battle if law 
and the process of, of law cannot use algorithms. In so far as we cannot roll back a world constructed by algorithms, the processes of justice also will have to use algorithms. Um, and this is not uh, just a normative uh, angle, but I'm saying from a very, very pragmatic uh, uh, instrumental angle. So that's a thought I would like uh, to leave. And I thank our loyal audience who've been coming uh, here through this series and thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.